Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for um, attending our online program with Oceanside Library. Uh, we're so fortunate to have uh, Professor Jace Bernhardt with us today from Hofstra University presenting us with this lecture on climate change on Long Island. It was originally scheduled to be a physical lecture in the library. So again, we're very fortunate that um, Professor Bernhardt could bring this online for us uh, on this gorgeous Earth Day. So thank you so much. And um, we, just so everybody knows, just some background. Um, I am muting everyone just so that it prevents any feedback or background sound. So if you get muted, that's just me working behind the scenes. But when it's time for questions in the end, feel free to turn your mic on. You can ask questions. But during the lecture, if you have any questions you don't want to forget, feel free to write them in the chat and um, I can read them to Jace as he's doing his presentation. All right, so again, thank you so much for joining us. And now I will hand it over to Professor Bernhardt. Thank you so much. Great, thanks so much for having me. As mentioned, my name is Jace Bernhardt. I'm a assistant professor at Hofstra University in the Department of Geology, Environment and Sustainability. I know that's a mouthful, but really uh, my teaching and research centers around uh, extreme weather and then also climate change, especially as it relates to our local area. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some climate change impacts for uh, Long Island here today. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, and happy Earth Day. April 22nd is Earth Day. It's actually the, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Earth Day started in 1970. Actually, it was created by Richard Nixon um, right around the time the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, was formed. Um, and now here we are celebrating um, with at least a nice day across the, the tri-state area today, which is nice. All right, so today we'll talk a little bit about some basics. So what is climate change? How do we observe this changing climate? Why it is the climate change? And then of course, the why do we care? So I would like to start off talking about climate change by looking at some pictures and visuals can be very uh, helpful in, in, uh, in thinking about this thing. So um, there's two pictures of the same uh, landscape here on the left and the right. So this is from the Canadian Rockies. Um, I took a trip there back in 2016. Um, very beautiful part of the world. Um, and they have a road called the Icefields Parkway, which unlike the Southern State Parkway where you have um, trees and traffic, the Icefields Parkway has beautiful mountains and glaciers on either side. So these are some of the most visited glaciers in the world. And this glacier here in particular that you're seeing in both images is called the Athabasca Glacier. Um, that is one of the most visited um, glaciers um, worldwide. So it so happens that my, uh, my advisor, my supervisor for my uh, PhD studies, did the same exact trip back in 1981. So he took a picture in 1981, when I went, he asked to see if I could take about the same picture to look at the change of the glacier. So you'll see 1981 on the left, and 35 years later, my picture uh, from 2016 on the right. And you can surely notice the myriad changes that we observe here. For example, look at how close the glacier is to the road. In 1981, the glacier is almost down to this parking lot here. By 2016, you can see it's well away from the parking lot. Also look at the thickness of the glacier. It extends uh, far to the left and right here in 1981 and up the sides of the mountain here. And by 2016, it's much more narrow and much more of the mountain is open. It's bare rock instead of having snow and ice on it. So this is sort of a good visual representation of, yes, changes are happening. Undoubtedly, we're losing um, our mass of glaciers, of ice around the world. And this is just one quick example of it that just by simply looking at two pictures, you can tell that there's changes here. So to sort of think about climate, we need to understand what exactly climate is. And sometimes climate and weather um, get uh, confused a bit. So I want to just draw the distinction between the two. Climate and weather measure very similar variables. That's why there can be some confusion. But they have very different connotations. And the big key is the so-called temporal or time scale. So climate and weather both deal with conditions in the atmosphere, the temperature, cloud covers, or rain falling, how strong is the wind, and uh, other sorts of things. But weather, we think about as these conditions on very short terms, the real time and also maybe hours to days. So basically, if you see a weather forecast on TV or on a phone app or a computer, um, that is going to be the weather scale of these variables. 
sort of the limits of prediction. You can really only predict with some accuracy out to about seven to 10 days. So anything on that scale or shorter is considered weather. Climate is a longer term scale. So it's average weather. So it's just averaging out those variables for longer time periods. Think months, years, decades, centuries, and even longer. So really, it's quite simple. Weather is the short-term conditions, and climate is just the long-term average of those conditions. So for example, climate would be like saying, you know, we know that July in Long Island is longer than January. We don't know exactly what the temperature will be in July or in January, but we know July is warmer than January. And how do we know that? It's from long-term climate. We know year after year, right, July is warm during the summer. January is cold during the winter. So that's sort of climate giving us um, giving us context. Also, we can get into good spatial variations thinking about climate. For example, we'd all agree that New York is colder than Miami, Florida. And again, climate is giving us that to us. The short the short term weather conditions are averaged out onto longer time scales. On a given day in July, it could actually be warmer in New York uh, than Miami. So weather tells us, well, that day New York is hotter. But climate tells us that we know overall Miami is a much warmer place than New York. So that's sort of a look at the different time scales there. Here's some picture that maybe help reinforce this. You might see images like this on TV or on social media. So weather on the right here is like a forecast. OK, what's the low for tonight from a couple days ago? Um, so that's weather, short term. Climate's longer term. This is giving us context. For example, for a given date, what's the average high and low temperature for the day, and what's the record high and low? You need lots of data, long-term uh, data, to get these numbers to average out what the the high is should be each day. It's not saying it will be that day, but the normal for that day is this number, and that's based on the long-term climate averages, looking at many years worth of, of weather data. And then the record, of course, you have to look at the extremes in that data set. What's the hottest it's ever been? On this day, what's the coldest it's ever been? And it's a typical summer day, so it happens to be in the Midwest. All right, so how do we gather climate data? So this, of course, has changed a lot throughout time. Where are we getting this data from that we then analyze to see if things are changing or not? So sort of in the, in the past, the standard for collecting weather data was, of course, handwritten and direct human observation. So for example, this is a... a weather observation page from the 1890s from Peoria, Illinois. And you can tell, of course, a human was taking these observations. They basically have to go outside, measure directly with instruments, um, or look at an instrument, and then mark down uh, the, uh, the data. For example, on the left, they have different uh, temperature observations from um, different parts of the day. And then you could, then it was very uh, labor intensive, but you could compile these pages of handwritten data into longer term climate patterns. Someone would have to sit there with a calculator and say, look at 30 years worth of, of, of observation sheets, add them all together and average things out. Start saying, okay, what's the average temperature in this place? Or what's the average temperature in January in this place? So as you can imagine, collecting and cataloging weather and climate data was challenging during this time period. But this is sort of the starting point uh, for creating what's called a record of uh, climate data from a certain location called a, a station. And even farther back in the past, we can still gain some insight into climate data. So yeah, if we wanna know what the climate was like in New York in 1900, we can go back and look at those handwritten sheets, which now been digitized so we can get it online. But to go even further back, there's actually ways to get data indirectly from so-called proxy data, or it's not directly measuring, say, temperature of the thermometer, but it's using an indirect source to get an estimation of temperature. And two popular ways to do that are called uh, tree rings and ice cores. So tree rings, so each year a tree grows a little bit, gets a little bit wider, and if you sort of cut into a tree, you can see the so-called rings showing the growth, these con concentric rings that radiate out each year. So it turns out that trees are sensitive to climate. Um, so warmer, colder conditions might be better or worse for a tree. So you can actually go back and cut a very thin slice through a tree, sort of like you see here, and then bring it into a scientific laboratory and measure the distance between the tree rings, which are very, very small numbers. As you can see, it's pretty tiny increments, might be millimeters, for example. 
And when there's a bigger space, when that means the tree grew more in a given year, which means maybe it's warmer, for example. And when there's less space, it means it grew less, so maybe it's colder. So looking at the tree rings, we can get an estimation of what the climate looked like going back to the lifetime of the tree. And some trees can be a few hundred years old. So now we can start going back even further in time to look at the longer term trend in climate. Then we can go back even further for some other types of proxy climate records. And one cool example is called ice cores. So these are very hardy scientists that go to, say, Antarctica or Greenland. And as you probably know, Antarctica and Greenland are covered with ice. It's called glaciers for the most part. And glaciers accumulate very slowly each year. Each year it's a little bit more of snow and ice, maybe just a few inches accumulates. But year after year, the glaciers you know, get bigger and have gotten bigger over time because there's a little bit accumulating each year. And each year when you get that accumulation, What's interesting is some air bubbles from the atmosphere get trapped um, sort of inside the snow and ice grains. So that sort of gives us a really unique record of atmospheres going back a long time ago. Essentially, if you drill down enough and take out a core of the ice, so there's a thin, long piece of ice, you can go back down below and then go down and get air bubbles that were trapped longer and longer times ago. And then you can go again back to the lab, look at the air bubbles, and actually estimate what the temperature is like, what the atmosphere is like during that time. And some of these ice cores have trapped air bubbles that date back to a few hundred thousand years ago. So again, we can then estimate the climate from those periods based on the composition of the air being trapped um, in, the, in the ice in these glaciers. So we can go back in the recent past for climate using direct measurements and human observations. And we can go back even further in time to estimate based on these so-called proxy or indirect sources like tree rings um, and ice cores. And there's other ways to get proxy data as well. These are just two examples. In the present, how do we get climate data? Well, it looks a lot different now. Now we have a lot of so-called automated weather stations. Instead of a person having to go out and record the data, put it, hand write it, and then eventually compiling it into a long-term climate record, Computers do the job for us automatically. You have observing equipment um, that, that takes uh, the, the measurements of, say, temperature in the atmosphere or the wind speed in the atmosphere and transmits it to a computer, which puts it online, and it's automatically up for people to view. And importantly, it's automatically being archived and allows you to easily average things out over longer time periods. So that has allowed us to really start recording a lot of data. And around the clock, 24-7, these automated weather stations are measuring data and giving us a, a complete record. However, there's only so many weather stations around. Um, they're not covering you know, every square foot of the Earth or something. But what a recent game changer has been is actually called satellites. So lots of different satellites um, orbiting the Earth well above the Earth's surface, way up in space. And of course, some of them are used for communications, so cell phone, GPS signals, television, and other important things. But there's actually some satellites up there that are dedicated to weather and climate observation. So it's really cool the satellite from up above can essentially take a picture of the Earth or gain some information about what sort of energy the Earth is giving off. And that can tell us the temperature of the Earth's surface or the ocean surface and other uh, variables. That allows us to get now a longer term record. Satellites have been giving us data for about 40 years now in some instances, since the late 70s. So now we have fairly long-term satellite records of how climate has been changing. And satellites are really important because unlike weather stations, which can of course only measure in one spot and not every spot is covered, a satellite can look at the entire Earth from up above. Um, or there's a, there's a network of satellites and different ones look at different chunks of the Earth. And all together they give us a complete record, not only 24-7, but also covering the entire Earth. So satellites have been very useful for really understanding how climate is and how it's been changing. And the last one here is a bit more um, advanced, but it is talked about sometimes. So-called reanalysis data sets. So reanalysis going back in time and analyzing or reanalyzing. Essentially that says, you know, maybe we didn't have as good data um, back in the day, or we did have the data, but things were done by hand, so we couldn't really connect it all together. Now we can sort of go back in time and with the luxury of computers, sort of connect all the data points we had that are sort of operating on their own, and then sort of interpolate in between. So all those points that were just having handwritten data, let's say, 
um, back several decades ago. Now we can sort of put them all together and get a nice picture of what things look like at a global level. So that's a, a quick bit on how we get this climate data. So what's the big deal now with climate? Well, climate has always changed due to natural variability. But the big thing now is the rate of change is novel. It's changing at a very quick rate, things like temperature. And we really haven't observed that um, naturally for a very long time. And the, what's the variable? What's the new thing? Well, it seems like humans are driving at least a considerable portion of this change. So that's why we hear a lot about climate change and tie it into our environmental science and our initiatives like Earth Day. It's because climate has always changed, but the rate of change has sped up very rapidly since the Industrial Revolution. And of course, this is the time period during when humans have been having a, a greater and greater influence on the global climate. So what are some ways that humans impact climate? So humans impact climate on a variety of scales. They can impact climate on local and regional scales, and then also, of course, on the global scale. And we're going to focus on the global scale here because that's generally that has the biggest impact. But I just want to mention it's not just these global scale impacts. It's also smaller scale impacts. For example, and this is important around Long Island and New York, urbanization or the fact that we've built up these large cities um, is going to have a, a important impact on our climate. Land use land cover change. So think about, for example, maybe out in the Midwest, you used to have a grassland and you plant corn in it, or you have a forest and you clear the forest away and put in agriculture, some sort of corn or soybeans or, or whatnot. Believe it or not, those can actually have impacts on the local climate. And then also pollution. Pollution emits lots of tiny little solid particles, they're called aerosols little tiny bits of uh, you know, burn stuff, basically. And those can actually have an have a effect as well, especially in those areas near those factories that are emitting the pollutants, or areas near cities um, that have lots of uh, traffic emitting uh, uh, aerosols from their car tailpipes and whatnot. So lots of smaller scale impacts. Those are important, but generally the most significant impact is going to be our large scale greenhouse gas emissions. So that's what I'm going to talk about here for a bit, because that's seen as having sort of the, the largest influence on the human side on our changing climate. So let's talk a bit about how the atmosphere works and how humans are changing this. So the atmosphere is made up primarily of nitrogen, oxygen, and argon. See the percentages here? That makes up about 99% of our atmosphere, give or take. And these gases stay the same. Their concentration does not change at all has not changed really since the early days of the Earth uh, when the atmosphere is still sort of forming and settling down. So these are called constant gases. Constant, they say the same. But there's a few other gases that take up a very small percentage of the Earth's concentration in the atmosphere, but they're changing. So carbon dioxide, CO2 in particular, also methane here, CH4, is another example. And then a few of these other gases are pretty stable, constant. But there's a few gases that do change. Those are called so-called variable gases. So constant gases on the left here make up the vast majority of the Earth's atmosphere, and they're consistent in volume. So it's nitrogen, oxygen, and argon are the big ones, about 99% of the Earth's uh, atmosphere. But these so-called variable gases, they're present in small amounts, but that does help allow their volume, their concentration to vary, to change, hence variable gases. And even just small fluctuations in these gases can have very important ramifications for environmental change. So a few of the important gases here are carbon dioxide, water vapor actually evaporated water that can form clouds, methane, and a few other gases that are all called greenhouse gases, which is a very important term that we'll get to next. And these variable or greenhouse gases are influenced by anthropogenic or human activity. Anthropogenic is just a fancy term we use for human impacts. So essentially humans play a role in putting more or less of these gases into the atmosphere, which in turn can have an impact on the environment through climatic change. So again, most of the variable or changing gases are also so-called greenhouse gases. GHG is the acronym we use sometimes. These play a very important role in our environment. It turns out these greenhouse gases act like a greenhouse, hence the terminology, 
And another convenient example, I think, is uh, your car parked outside on a, on a sunny day. Just think about either a greenhouse or your car out on a sunny day. And I'm sure you've noticed if you, you leave your car, come back an hour later, the car ends up getting a lot hotter than the surrounding environment than, say, the outside. And that's because your car and then the greenhouse does a similar thing, actually does its own mini greenhouse effect, which is what these greenhouse gases can do on a much larger scale in the Earth's atmosphere. What happens is these greenhouse gases have a certain molecular structure that allows sunlight to pass through, or so-called shortwave radiation. It's a shorter wavelength of, of energy coming through. So that shortwave wavelength, short, sorry, shortwave radiation from the sun is allowed to come through the gases and get down to the Earth's surface. That sunlight's absorbed by the Earth's surface, and then some of it is sent back up. But now it's a different type of, of energy. It's called long-wave radiation. The Earth gives off essentially infrared radiation, and the sun is giving off um, shorter wavelength and uh, radiation. So essentially the Earth changes it a bit. And the key point here is that that long-wave radiation the Earth gives off, now that it's a different type of energy, those gases that let the sunlight through, turns out they like to trap, they're able to trap due to the molecular structure, some of this escaping uh, long wave energy from the Earth, and then bounce it back down. Some of it goes out to space, and some of it gets trapped in. So think about it, this is a warming effect because these gases allow the sunlight to come through, but then trap some of the energy trying to escape back out, the long wave energy from the Earth's surface. So as a result, you have a warming effect just like your car, really this, a similar uh, phenomenon is happening when your car gets hot. The glass windows and the windshield of the car allow sunlight to come through. It's absorbed by the seats, especially the dark, the dashboard, everything in your car. Then it's given back off as long wave radiation, but now the windows in your car, the windshield, can trap some of that long wave radiation escaping and bounce it back into the car. So the car warms up because you have more coming in and less going out, so a net warming effect. Same thing in a greenhouse and same thing on a larger scale in the Earth's atmosphere. So what's the big deal about this? These greenhouse gases occur naturally, especially water vapor, which is important. Um, but some of them we can add to the atmosphere through, through human or anthropogenic activities. So human activities on balance are adding more of these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And as a result, we've seen a warming. And we can make a connection and say at least some of this warming is likely due to the human emissions of these so-called greenhouse gases. Here's a picture that hopefully helps explain. Maybe it's more confusing, but I put it in here. Again, greenhouse gases, notice that they let all the sunlight through. And different things happen to sunlight. Some of it gets reflected by clouds. Some of it gets directly bounced back up by the Earth's surface out to space. Notice the greenhouse gases, some of this sunlight that tries to escape, these two orangish lines here, some of it gets bounce back down towards the Earth's surface. We have a net gain of heating the more greenhouse gases you have. Now, greenhouse gases are, are important to the Earth's survival. Without these at all, we'd be have much more extreme swings in temperature because more of the uh, sunlight would just escape back out to space, and especially night times and cold seasons could get very cool. Um, but of course, if we enhance the greenhouse effect even more than it already is, that can lead to a warming effect because now more there's more trapping of this energy, of this heat. So again, it turns out these human anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions seem to be tipping the balance to more warming because more heat is being trapped. Carbon dioxide or CO2 is a greenhouse gas you may have heard of before. It's not the only one though. It's the one that has the most concentration, but it's not the only one. There's also gases such as methane, nitrous oxide, and a tongue twist here, chlorofluorocarbon or CFCs. And these also lead to uh, an enhanced greenhouse effect and a warming effect. So for example, we always like to show this cartoon in our college classes because it shows the many different ways that humans can put greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So as you might imagine, this cartoon relates to the effect of methane. So methane uh, can come from, uh, lack of better words, cow flatulence um, through enhanced agricultural practices. And actually, it turns out it's not just that, but also cow um, belches that can lead to methane as well. So it shows a wide variety of human activities that can lead to more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And methane is just one of many examples. And methane uh, goes in the atmosphere from human activities, 
such as livestock grazing. The more livestock you graze, the more methane they could put in the atmosphere. And then that is a greenhouse gas that leads to more trapping of the heat and a warming impact. So we have a, a variety of greenhouse gases that can contribute to this global warming effect. Just wanted to show some details about them. Don't worry too much about all the nitty gritty in here. I'm just gonna go through a few lines. So this is a table that shows some important aspects of these different greenhouse gases that humans have added to in the atmosphere. First row is carbon dioxide or CO2. And we look at this in terms of what's called parts per million ppm, or parts per million per volume. So it's saying if we had a million little dots that represented the atmosphere, how many of those dots would be a certain gas? So CO2 is 280 parts per million in before the Industrial Revolution. And as of 2011, I know this is a bit out of date, but it's, it's a good table. Now we're up to about 400, so a little over 400. So we've gone up significantly. We've, we've increased by almost 50% the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. And of course, it's due to human industrial activity because it was pretty stable before the Industrial Revolution. And now it's gone up significantly from all sorts of different human impacts, um, factories and emissions from cars and even some indirect um, causes of, of it going in the atmosphere. Important to note that these gases don't just go up and disappear. They can stick around for a while. CO2 can vary depending on certain conditions, but a going rate could be CO2 that's emitted is in the atmosphere for 80 or 90 years. So not only is there, so the impact is a bit lagged. Not only is there an impact fairly imminently from the gas going up, but the gas stays in the atmosphere for a while. So you have a longer term influence as well. Yeah, and as I mentioned, here's some of the, the different ways you can put CO2 in the atmosphere. And one important point to note is this idea of GWP. That's called global warming potential. That's just saying sort of how strong of a greenhouse gas is it. So bang for buck, how much sunlight or how much um, escaping energy can it trap? So the higher the number, the, the stronger it is. So we do this by saying CO2 is a global warming potential of one. These other gases are compared to it. So for example, methane GWP of 25 says that methane is 25 times more stronger than CO2. So you'll note there's a lot less methane in the atmosphere than CO2, but methane is a lot stronger than CO2 of a greenhouse gas. So that's why we still should, should look into methane as well. Nitrous oxide is the third largest and has an even higher GWP. And notice, for example, nitrous oxide sticks around for over 100 years on average. So that's one of the reasons why it's able to trap more energy. Obviously, the longer it sticks around, the more potential it has to impact the climate. And last but not least, these gases, very scary looking, and they are actually detrimental. These are probably called the CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, because they all have a carbon and a fluorine in their molecular structure. And notice how some of these weren't even around, and they're sort of synthetic from human creations. And even though they have very tiny concentrations now, we look at their GWP, and in some cases, they're thousands of times stronger than CO2. So there's very tiny concentrations of these gas, but they're so powerful that even just a tiny amount of them in the atmosphere can have a noticeable impact. And some of them can even stick around for many thousands of years, which can extend that influence that they have. But again, CO2 is sort of the one we talk about the most because it is, at the end of the day, by far have the highest concentration of any um, variable gas, and again, humans, are putting in by far more CO2 than anything else in the atmosphere. So we like to observe how is carbon dioxide, how is CO2 changing? So sort of the gold standard for CO2 observation is from Hawaii, from what's called Mauna Loa Observatory, one of those volcanic mountains that makes up Hawaii. And this is a good spot to look at CO2 because it's sort of isolated. It's, it's its own little spot in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So there's not really much local pollution. Uh, that can have a big influence on this. So it's a really good sort of global um, look at what's CO2 in the atmosphere. And we've been keeping records here since the late 1950s, so we have uh, over 60 years now. The black line shows the average uh, concentration year by year. And we all would agree there's a consistent increase. Not only an increase, but it seems to be going up at a higher rate over time. So it's increased just in the 60... So your period from, from about 310 parts per million to almost 410. So we've seen an increase of about 100 parts per million, about a 30% increase in CO2 
in just a little over 60 years. And you can imagine this is why we might expect to see some warming. More CO2 and other greenhouse gases and more warming, uh, more trapping, and well, we've seen the 30% increase. And it's a bit more complicated than that. There's some other factors that go back and forth, but generally increased greenhouse gases, all else being equal, you'd expect some sort of warming uh, for the lower atmosphere of the Earth and the surface of the Earth. And also important to note, there's a lot of dynamics here at this. And the red line here, certainly shows that. Notice how even though it's going up, every year CO2 has a natural up and down cycle. And it turns out this is due to vegetation dynamics. So the fact is that the northern hemisphere really dominates um, the globe in terms of vegetation. There's actually much less landmass in the southern hemisphere than the northern hemisphere. And if you recall learning about photosynthesis ever, um, vegetation, especially big trees, is a lot of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis takes in CO2. So we're seeing this reflection of the northern hemisphere vegetation trends here. CO2 is a maximum around this time of year. Notice how it's going up here about March or April. That's because, as we know, in New York, for example, all the vegetation has died through the winter. And when vegetation dies, it releases CO2 up in the atmosphere. Then in the spring, the vegetation comes back, leaves start growing, start doing photosynthesis. And that takes down, draws down CO2 from the atmosphere. So by the fall, by September, October, you reach a minimum because you've had several months of the northern hemisphere vegetation removing CO2 from the atmosphere. Not a ton, but we do see definitely an impact. And that gets at the many different, the many different impacts that humans can have um, directly and indirectly on CO2. For example, think about sequestration of where is carbon dioxide held. As we just demonstrated, trees and vegetation have a big influence on CO2 levels in the atmosphere. So if we get rid of trees, if we do deforestation, that also puts more CO2 in the atmosphere because those trees that we're holding CO2 are gone. So it goes back up into the air. Oceans are also a, a spot where actually a lot of CO2 is held. And it turns out that um, oceans, as they warm up, actually hold less CO2. So warming oceans can also put some additional carbon dioxide, CO2, into the atmosphere. And both of these can sort of be called so-called positive feedback cycle, or cycle that sort of reinforce themselves and unfortunately spin out of control, which is why climate scientists often are concerned about things going forward. Think about it. If you warm things up, the oceans get warmer and they hold less CO2, so more CO2 is in the atmosphere. You trap even more energy, you warm things up more, you release more CO2. So you can imagine how this can get a bit out of control. And if we keep, and if humans uh, get rid of forests, the same sort of thing can happen. You clear out forests, release CO2, and you have more warming. So yeah, the big deal here is we've noted this big connection between temperature and CO2. Just focus on the bottom two graphs here, the black and the blue. So the black line here, and this is, by the way, going right to left. So the right is sort of the present day, zero years ago. And going to the left, you see 100,000, 200,000, 300,000, and so on years ago. So the black line shows temperature change. This is from Antarctica, um, where we have those ice cores that we took, actually. And the blue line shows the CO2 concentration, um, also from that same spot. Because when we go and get those little air bubbles from our ice cores, we can tell what sorts of uh, gases are in the atmosphere and show what the temperature is like. Notice this pretty strong connection, right? When temperature is higher, CO2 is higher. When temperature gets lower, CO2 is getting lower, and so on and so forth. So you probably heard the adage that causation does not imply, sorry, correlation does not imply causation. It's so just because these two things look similar doesn't mean that they control each other. But now that we have this physical basis, this greenhouse effect, we can say, okay, well, it does seem that increased CO2 is causing temperature rise because of that enhanced greenhouse effect. And the little yellow lines here just show what's called interglacial periods. So in the yellow, you're in a not ice age, and then in between, you are in an ice age. Because notice how both these lines are lower in between. So we actually were in an ice age um, that peaked at about 120, well, we went into our last ice age about 120,000 years ago. And you can see we got colder and colder, less CO2. And until about 20 or so thousand years ago, glaciers came all the way down to the North Shore of Long Island, actually, in parts of New York City. And now we've been coming out of the Ice Age. And yes, 
coming out of the ice age was due to natural factors. But that took a very long time. Notice how these temperature changes occur over thousands of years, as we see there's a very long scale on this graph, thousands of years. Now we see big temperature changes happening over decades. So that's really um, the concern, is that temperature changes are now happening very quickly. When you go into and out of an ice age, not everything, but lots of uh, natural systems can adapt because it occurs over a long time period. But now if we're seeing big changes over very short time periods, it's hard for ecosystems to adapt. And of course, even humans in some instances to quickly adapt to such rapid changes. So now here's a zoom in on the very recent time period. And this is a look at data from NASA. So um, actually mainly just averaging out these weather stations that again have been, we've been taking the handwritten data to start going back to the 1800s. And now of course we have the automated data as well. This is combining both the land and oceans. Land actually heats up quicker than oceans. And people live on the land, but oceans take up more, of course, of the Earth's surface. And it's important to think about both. So this is saying, okay, um, sort of based on our, based on the middle here, based on 1950 or so, how has the temperature looked? So this is saying temperature anomaly, anomaly just means difference with respect to the normals from 1951 to 1980. So based on the 30 years of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, how did any given year during this time period compare? So notice how you're negative. Notice how you're cooler than normal at the start. And now you're much warmer than normal because the climate has warmed. So for example, here in 2020 now, just about, we're almost one degree Celsius warmer globally, just a little under one degree Celsius warmer, which is about uh, one and a half degrees Fahrenheit warmer than we were just in the mid to late 1900s. So a clear upward change, a notable change, that's occurred during human human lifetime scales. So that's sort of the big deal. Normally a change like this might take centuries to occur when there's only natural impacts on climate, but the human influence the greenhouse gas emissions. Now we're looking at this impact happening um, on the scale of just decades. I'll talk a bit about the local climate change impacts now as we head towards the end of uh, the talking part. And very important to note that another impact from, from this climate change is sea level rise. Ocean levels are expected to go up, and um, that can have an influence on Long Island. This is actually a picture taken from uh, Oceanside a few years ago, and you notice the, the house is getting elevated, it's going up on stilts. And sea level rise can mean that storms and tides can come in higher. If there's a foot more of sea level, that means a foot more of tide and water can come into low-lying coastal areas, such as the south shore of Long Island. So humans are forced to adapt, for example, trying to lift their home level up so their basement floods less. And of course, this can mean that sand, a storm like Sandy, even though Sandy itself you can't necessarily attribute to climate change, but if climate change led to an extra foot of water, of surge coming in, well, then everything was higher and more of an impact. For example, this is uh, from the Bay Park uh, power plant around East Rockaway. And you'll note 10.9 feet of water of surge of ocean water came in here from Sandy. And perhaps if Sandy hit 100 years ago, without the sea level rise, this, this level would have been a bit lower. Still devastating, but even more potential for damage uh, when you have extra water coming in. Wait, Jake, can I interrupt for a yeah. second? Yeah. Um, in that last picture, um, so when they made that, are they, like the 16 feet they're not hoping that <laughs> ever gets you know it's kind of funny yeah that yeah hopefully yeah hopefully we don't get that high it is you know just sort of sort of showing the, the just for sort of i guess a visual of you know the different elevations so yeah hopefully oh. 10 9 feet was the highest ever there i believe and hopefully that stays that way yeah, for a very long yeah. Time. i've been so, to that yeah. park it is right on the water so i'm sure yeah that they definitely got severely affected by it but thank you for showing us that photo i've yeah. seen it before yeah yeah exactly and right the 10.9 feet is right at you know at the uh at the uh at the coast right at the water there but obviously that water since we're so flat it's not sure it can get inland and that's why um plenty of folks in oceanside i know rockville center even places up right. a little bit and the water still got flooding because 10.9 feet of water just doesn't stop instantly. It can come in. And it can right. also um, flood bodies of water. The Mill River, for example, over in Rockville Center um, and uh, going uh, through neighboring communities, that is fed by the water. So that's going to flood as well in a case like this. 
Yeah. So, and that did, yeah, so that did flood during Sandy. So yeah, we see the important impact of water. And right, the big takeaway is that sea level has been rising. Here's the observations from out at Montauk Point. And just since the late 40s, it looks like there's been a rise, um, as you can see here, about three or so millimeters per year. That doesn't sound like a lot, but if you add that up year after year, it's saying, um, if you look at this graph and sort of extrapolate it back from 1900, 1900 um, to the present, we've gone up by about 0.4 meters, um, and that's going to start equating to a foot of, of sea level rise, give or take, or even a little more. So again, extra sea level to get pushed in during these events like Sandy, and even just a big coastal winter storm can have greater impacts. And quickly, what causes the sea level rise? Two main impacts. One is thermal expansion, so water actually expands as it gets warmer, so the level goes up. And two, melting of land-based ice sheets. So there's two important types of ice. There's ice that's on land, like on a continent, so like Greenland. And Antarctica, our land masses, if you got rid of the ice, they'd actually just be bare land. But there's these glaciers, there's this ice that has formed on it because it's so cold there. You also have the ice floating around in the, uh, in the ocean, sea ice, you know, like icebergs. If that sea ice melts, it's fine because you're not getting anything extra. It's like if you have a glass of water and the ice cubes melt, the water doesn't all of a sudden overflow the glass, just a different volume displacement uh, from the solid ice to liquid water. But if you add extra water to the glass, right, then it can then it can flood. And that's the issue of land ice. Land ice is on the continents. It wasn't in the water. That land ice melts, runs off, eventually gets in the oceans. And then that can lead to the rise. And we've had melting over time of uh, both land ice and sea ice with this warming we've observed. So globally, it's really the same picture. We've seen this increase in sea level. And notice how the trend seems to be accelerating. Um, so even more impacts down the road, perhaps. And we've gotten sort of more accurate measurements over time. At first, we just could use um, actual sort of buoys floating in the water to measure sea level and show us the change over time. But now, more recently, in the last 25 years or so, we actually have satellites can tell us what the level of the sea is. It can really give us great data. So that can now cover the whole ocean instead of just a few buoys scattered around and give us even more certainty that the uh, sea level is rising perhaps rising at an accelerating rate. And this is globally, but it can vary. Some places like Long Island might even see more sea level rise than the global average. For example, due to the shape of our, uh, our coasts and our inland bays and waterways can have an impact as well. All right, so I'm just gonna end up here on what does the misty distant future hold? Of course, the big question is what's gonna happen in the future? And of course, there's uncertainty with all this. So we run what are called GCM, general circulation models or climate models. And long story short, those um, are gonna take in our current conditions with the climate and say, okay, I was gonna run on a supercomputer, use all these equations and say, what's gonna happen in the future that we think. Um, so this works at a global scale. So it's not necessarily good for very detailed, like exact points, like what exactly is gonna happen in New York City or Long Island, but globally it gives us a picture of what's going to happen over time. And these are estimates. There's different climate models that are run by different organizations. They all study different equations for saying how the physics work in, in the Earth's atmosphere. They also take in slightly different data. So it's best to sort of think about a range of possible results when you look at this GCM data. But it gives us a good estimate as to what's gonna happen. It's important to note there's sort of uh, two aspects of the uh, uncertainty with these projections. Um, um, and the first bullet point here and on the left says there's different climate models. So these different color lines here are different climate models that are run. Some are run by U.S. organizations. These NCAR ones, for example, that's run out in Colorado by a big center for atmospheric research. The GFDL is run close to home at Princeton University. And then, if, and then the Hadley Center is actually run over in Europe. So different organizations, different scientific groups run different models. And again, they all have different ways of looking at the atmosphere. So unsurprisingly, they give you different results. But it's good to sort of have this range of scenarios, sort of like saying in a weather forecast, okay, different scenarios, different models, three to six inches of snow is possible. This is saying, okay, different projections, but somewhere in the ballpark of a two to five degrees Celsius of warming is possible. So that's one bit of uncertainty, the different climate models. Then you can even run one climate model in a different way, 
what are called different admission scenarios. And this says we don't know what humans are going to do in terms of emitting CO2, carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gas. We know that humans are having the impact, but no one has the uh, proverbial crystal ball to say what will humans do in the future. We don't know how the economies will, shape, will be in the future. We don't know what politicians will be in power. We don't know if there's some new invention that will change things. So we run in different emission scenarios into these climate models, these GCMs, general circulation models. And these just give us different sort of trajectories of what might happen to CO2 emissions. So basically these higher graphs here, like this orange line and this short red dotted line shows, okay, we're gonna keep emitting more and more CO2. We're not gonna really make any steps to, to uh, tamp down our, our emissions. Some of the other lines here, for example, the blue and the green show, okay, we're gonna start getting more efficient, especially the green shows, we're actually gonna start lowering our emissions of CO2. For whatever reason, we're gonna get more efficient. And uh, that is going to, um, of course, then give us different results. If we think we're gonna keep emitting more greenhouse gases, more CO2, that will probably lead to more warming. If we get more efficient and emit less CO2, they'll still be warming because of that lag, that fact that the, the, the gases stay in the atmosphere for a while, but they'll be much less warming. Essentially, we have two bits of uncertainty when we look at future projections. We have this, the uncertainty from the science, so different models show different results, but also the emissions, and that's a bigger uncertainty because really, physical systems, we have a pretty good handle on. We're not totally sure how things work. We have a pretty good handle. So there's a limited amount of uncertainty with how exactly the climate system will respond in the future. But again, humans, we know people are so hard to predict what they're going to do. So the emissions, there's a large amount of uncertainty. And one more thing I don't really need to spend too much time on, but also these general circulation models are run over not so great a resolution, or it splits the world up into each grid box, into lots of grid boxes. Each grid box is a pretty big area, like all of Long Island, for example. So you can't really locally get too much insight. All right, and then finally, the big question here is, what do we do? So we've learned that humans are impacting climate. How can we try to both limit our future impacts and mitigation and also adapt to the impacts that are already happening? And we know that this is very fraught because there's important economic and political implications. I was gonna mention a few things that have been proposed or been happening. This calls to cut down, of course, CO2 emissions, carbon dioxide emissions directly. Perhaps through direct carbon tax, well, that's never really worked in the U.S. Some, a few states have actually tried to put that on as a state law, but it's failed. Um, but there's sort of less stringent ways of doing this so-called cap-and-trade program, the REGI, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative in the Northeast U.S. This is a coalition of Northeast U.S. states that um, basically um, um, promote industries, certain corporations with lots of emissions get more efficient by essentially saying you have X amount of CO2 you can emit, and you have to pay a fine if you emit more. But if you get a, if you get efficient emit less, you can sell your extra allowance to a company that hasn't got as, as efficient yet. So that sort of gives an economic incentive to uh, lower or at least stabilize your CO2 emissions, but that's not quite as direct as a carbon tax. You can also purposely do land use and cover changes. For example, if you start growing back forests, those trees, remember, can, in, can take in the CO2, and that can allow there to be some less greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And of course, you can do human behavior impacts like trying to use more energy efficient um, things like appliances or vehicles, or using more renewable energy, such as uh, offshore wind, which is going up off of uh, the coast of the east end of Long Island. And this just gets us the idea of, okay, from one of those previous images, we saw emissions are gonna keep going up, they're projected in this um, many models to double from eight gigatons of carbon per year, it's a big number, to 16 over a 50-year period from 2000 to 2050 or so. So researchers at Princeton University developed this model called the Adaptation and Mitigation Wedges, which says, okay, we can't just do a, one huge impact, like we can't tell people to stop driving or something, but we can do these small impacts on each industry and if we can come up with sort of eight different ways to bring down the emissions by one gigaton each, that stabilizes us and keeps the emissions the same by 2050. And it makes us poised to start doing less after that. And then again, have less of that warming influence. So for example, one wedge could just be okay, you know, the, ve the average vehicle miles per gallon goes up by 20 miles per gallon, for example. Or another could be, we start putting in 
a certain percentage of energy, electricity has to come from wind power, solar power, or other renewables. So instead of just totally disrupting one industry, it's making incremental changes in a bunch of different areas to then limit our emissions. So I think, as you can see, climate change is a very complex, multifaceted issue. It deals with many natural systems, but also there's a lot of human system involvement, which leads to, of course, um, the political debate and just a lot of uncertainty as to what's going to happen in the future, because we just don't know how humans are going to act. So I'm happy to take some questions in the last few minutes here. And if you want to reach out over another venue, there's my contact info, my, my email, and my uh, Twitter handle. And I want to thank everyone for their, their time and attention today. Oh, well, thank you, Jace. That was a great presentation and really educational. And sometimes things that, you know, like you know a part of it, but you don't know the whole thing or you don't understand, you know, the educational background of it, you kind of just say, oh, sea levels are rising, but no one really knows how. So this was um, this was really informative. Thank you. And it's, it, you know, it's just ironic that Earth Day is happening during all of this because on the news they have been talking about, um, you know, the, um, how you know the climate has been positively affected by everyone quarantining because there's less gases and um less you know us putting less um fumes and stuff out into the earth so this kind of was a, a good time to to be seeing this presentation so that all worked out um but thank you for that does anyone have any any questions for for professor bernhardt or any comments you can write it in the chat if you don't um want to put your mic on No questions yet, but um, but again, thank you, um, Professor Bernhardt. That was really, really uh, informative. That was a great presentation, and we really appreciate you doing this presentation for us on Earth Day. That couldn't have worked out better. Oh yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's happy to do it. Great. Here, oh, let me end the recording. Here, hold on.